um, component-driven front-end development talk, so just make sure you're in the right room. Um, so my name's John Inu, I work for uh, Decent, we're a digital agency, uh, we have a distributed team, um, and we build um, web applications and um, websites um, in a variety of different technologies, so I thought it'd be worth just giving you a background about Decent first. Um, so you understand where we're coming from and like where we've where we've been over the last few years, which has led, led to um, this process that I'm going to be describing today. Um, so we're build, building things with um, a number of technologies. So there's Drupal on the back end, um, but we're also building things with WordPress, um, and we're also building things with Laravel, um, and we also use a number of front-end technologies as well, um, React, Angular JS. Um, but we also have sort of pure Drupal builds in there as well. Um, and um, as an agency, what we were looking at doing is trying to fr uh, standardize our front-end process so that we could use the same uh, way that we build front-end, the way that we approach front-end, um, regardless of the technology and the application type of the back-end. Also, we wanted to free our front-end development team um, from whatever was at the back-end so that they were making good decisions about uh, the way they were structuring their applications, the way they were structuring the front-end components um, that weren't um, restricted by whatever the back-end technology happened to be. Um, so this talk is going to kind of guide us through um, the ideas around component-driven development or pattern-driven development, as it's known in some courses. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about um, kind of the industry be best practice and things that are coming out that um, you, you know, some of you may be aware of. Um, but this is very much... Um, a, a, a discussion of a journey, really, the journey that Decent have made. And some of you may be already going down some of these paths. Some of you may have a approach, really, that means that um, what you're doing at the moment is perfectly fine and um, some of these things don't make a lot of sense to you. So hopefully there'll be things in here that you'll find interesting um, and there'll be some takeaways as well. Um, and we're talking about so the, the generic approach to component-driven development, uh, how this might fit into a Drupal development workflow process, um, and then some, uh, looking at some tools and approaches, so there'll be a bit of code at the end um, in the last few slides. Okay, so we'll start with web pages. Um, so the starting point for us projects are the idea of web pages. Uh, and a web page is kind of the, the central component, I think, for, uh, um, for us and for a lot of our clients, the way that they think about things is all around the page. So there's a lot of conversation, a lot of requirements, uh, gathering, um, and a lot of language that comes from the client end, which is around, um, well, we need a page that does this, or we need, um, you know, how long is this home page going to build? Um, so a lot of the conversations are starting around pages, and we want to try and uh, change that approach. Um, so this is a quote that you see in a number of places, uh, Stephen Hay, we're not designing web pages, we're not designing pages, we're designing systems of components. I think this is kind of the approach that front end would like to be able to take, um, that we're actually talk talking about the domain in terms of the, the client's domain, um, and that we're building components that make sense for the, for the client. Um, and at the same time, the thing we're actually building, the web application itself, is a, uh, primarily a user interface. So we're thinking about things in terms of those small component parts of a user interface, um, you know, breaking the system down to those reusable parts that can then be taken uh, and, and applied throughout the system rather than thinking of them as collections of pages to be built. Um, so taking that first example, we start to look at a, uh, look at a web page and um, you know, if this is something that a designer has produced and they've produced you this wonderful web page and the front end starts to look at it and thinking, how am I going to break this down into parts? So you know, a header, a content listing, a footer. Um, and we started looking at, well, is there anything out there that kind of gives us some good guidance about how we should be breaking down our, um, our, our user interface and our components? Um, and um, this is probably something that a number of you have seen before, and if you haven't gone to that web page and read that blog post, I highly recommend it, because this is um, someone's really sort of deep thinking around this approach, um, which is atomic design. And this is the idea of breaking up your uh, design into component parts, so starting with... Uh, and they, th this idea is kind of like um, understanding what the different parts of a, of a web page are, so, and then giving them kind of collecting them into names, so your atoms are your base parts of a website. Um, these are the, the very smallest component pieces, so these are your user interface elements, your buttons, your headings, your labels, uh, and then some of those components will then come together to form molecules, um, and then form, uh, come together again to form uh, organisms. But this is just one approach to it, and there's, there's, there's many ways you can cut up a web page and many sort of uh, conceptual models you can place on that. Um, so taking that first example of the web page there, then we might look at um, the smaller components being um, uh, like a button, a uh, button design, 
Um, and then the button forms part of a, a sort of a larger molecule, as um, you can think of it, um, which is kind of that teaser, the info panel. Um, and then a number of those panels then collect together to create something uh, much larger, so uh, uh, a, a, listing, a, a listing element on the page. Um, and the process of the front end then is to then kind of take those, um, those elements, uh, define them in HTML and CSS, uh, and then provide a, a style guide which gives your development team uh, the thing to work from so they can understand what these individual element, uh, component parts of your website are. Um, and they're going to be reusing those throughout the build, throughout the pages and things that come together. So this is the end product um, to this approach, and this is the style guide. And a style guide isn't something that just shows off the various aspects of the design. Uh, used properly, they're a collaboration tool, um, bringing the design and the development teams together. So we can all look at these things and try to understand what the individual parts of the website are. Um, so it's, yeah, and as well as a tool to break down the user interface components into its component parts rather than just thinking about it as a whole or as a series of pages. Um, and of course they also serve as the uh, resource for new designers and developers to locate uh, existing patterns in the future. Um, that website there, styleguides.io, is a collection of um, style guides that other people have produced. Um, it's a really, really useful resource to go and have a look at and get that kind of inspiration of what these style guides are. Um, particularly good style guides, as well as being uh, defining those base patterns, they also start to demonstrate exactly how the code is going to work with each of these uh, uh, each of these elements. It also describes the purpose of each of these elements as well, so that you can understand what these things are and how they're going to be used in the future. Um, and you can even extend that even further and start to actually talking about them as um, something that's useful to the content editing teams as well, so they can look at these things and understand not only the purpose, but perhaps the tone of voice that should be used when they're being used. Um, um, so that's kind of an overview of the, of the process. Um, like I say, having a look at the atomic design principles is a particularly good place to uh, pick up some of this information. Um, now I just wanted to go through how this actually works in practice and so look at how you might fit it into a, uh, an application development work uh, workflow uh, like, um, like a Drupal build. Um, so this is probably a very typical place that we were at a few years ago uh, where you'd have um, a sort of waterfall uh, pattern. Uh, you'd start off with some people doing some UX work um, and then the output of that phase would be some wireframes. And those wireframes would be passed to the designers who would then transform those into color PhD, PSDs, um, but full page designs, and those eventually be get passed down to your application development team um, who are then told, here's the, here's the beautiful designs, you've got to go and build them. And in the case of a Drupal build, this usually means kind of getting, installing Drupal, getting Drupal to a point where um, you can then create your uh, nodes and your, your various elements of the page. Um, so get things to as close as you can to the, the, those designs, um, and then you start theming. Um, and and the, the Drupal theme is kind of a it's kind of an exception layer. It's kind of like I want everything that Drupal does, um, apart from I'd like some different CSS and different styling in these places. And so we're overriding what Drupal does uh, in each of these points. Um, and where we, we kind of wanted to be close towards was actually saying, can we take the front end out so that we can produce these HTML style guides? So we've got these um, HTML CSS guides that allow the front enders to work in isolation of the back end. So it adds this extra layer into the process. So UX producing wireframes, designs producing their designs, and then front end producing their HTML CSS style guides. Um, and then your application development team have then got something they can work on. Um, so their process is still pretty similar. Um, but front end now has been freed from whatever that back end technology happens to be, um, and they can now try implementing these things inside of uh, uh, on their own on their own models. Um, and when you free that, then you get a slightly different approach to actually rather than that waterfall approach. What we can do instead now is have an approach that looks more like this, where the project timeline goes along the bottom, and in the initial phase of the project, UX is spending more time on the work, um, but design can get involved a little bit earlier. Front end can get involved a little bit earlier, and the application development team can get, um, get involved a little bit earlier as well. Um, so you have, um, instead of having those kind of strict sign-offs, we can kind of morph and evolve the solution uh, as time goes on. Um, so I think one of the things we were finding is that uh, we were saying we were a, an agile delivery team, but realistically the only agile part was the the last part, the application development, once all of these things had finished, they had a clear sign-off in between each one, and then we started the application development. 
um, but this is where we wanted to be. Um, so, uh, kind of the way this, this works in practice then is that there will still be that UX phase at the start. There will still be wireframes produced, but the UX team needs to be thinking in terms of components. So they are actually building, rather than thinking in terms of pages, they themselves, the UX team, are thinking in terms of components. And so they're kind of building blocks on the page, um, and these blocks are, need to be given names. Um, so they're actually defining it at that time. So we go, yeah, here's the wireframe. Here's a pattern within that wireframe. So it's not coming out very well on the, uh, <laughs> the slides, but there's a pattern within the wireframe. Um, and that pattern has got uh, a name. It's got fields, and these fields are defined. And this is the team defining these, these elements. So this isn't the UX person working alone or the UX and the designer, um, but there will be a developer there as well, and the front end will be thinking about it all together. One of the critical points of this, is this phase is, is naming the components so that we all have an understanding of what these uh, components are uh, and what their purpose is right from the start. Um, and if possible, you can then get in the flow. Uh, so we're, we're a distributed team, um, so we're doing this on a wiki. Um, it might be that uh, if you're co-located, you just do this on your, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on the wall in the office, and everyone can kind of look at it and grab things and understand what's going on. Um, but uh, we have wiki pages which are uh, exist for each of these uh, components. We're defining the components collaboratively. We're giving them names, um, and then because they are individual things, they can be given Jira tickets and they can be tracked through the process. Um, so whereas before our front-end process might have been, and our design process might have been a bit ad hoc, where people would, would design things, showing the client, design things, showing the client. Um, this time we can actually say, well, that this component needs designing and it needs going through the process. Um, and if you get good at this, and over time, it's possible that you can get to a point where. Um, uh, on the right-hand side here, we've got um, at the top we've got the wireframe. Uh, underneath we've got the the designed component, um, and then at the same time, evolving the solution, the, the front enders in pure HTML and CSS are constructing uh, a web page, which is also evolving as the design solution evolves. Um, so they can take those those elements as wireframes and start to build the components, um, but just grayscale. Um, and then if the design is completed, they can come back and start adding the, uh, the, the, the details of the design into the front end. Um, and this is quite a, a, a difficult thing to, to, to manage, uh, mostly because the clients are going to want to see that they like the sign-off points, they like those, um, uh, those points in the project. They say, like, yes, now a design is finished, now let's move on to the next thing. But as we all know, that's not really how projects work, and that the design will evolve over time anyway. Um, and it's, it, if you can get to a point where we can convince the clients that, yes, um, uh, it's important to get some direction, so we'll have maybe one, one or two page designs that are finished, um, but we can get into this kind of iterative build cycle earlier. Um, it, I think it's, it's better for the project, and it means that things can evolve a lot quicker. Um, so that's the evolving solution. So you can imagine this start, starting to be produced. Um, but at some point, this also needs to then, then flow into Drupal. So once a few of these components are ready, um, the Drupal backend is because they also have access to um, those same um, wiki pages. Um, they will be producing the Drupal assets, um, and then we need to then integrate the two things. So what's coming out of front end is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, some um, static uh, con um, assets like images. Um, and these things now need to be integrated into your, um, into your Drupal theme. Now one of the problems with the static style guide is you've now duplicated effort in some situations. So you've now got HTML in your static style guide, and you also have your twig templates inside your Drupal theme, and these are two separate things. Um, and this is, a, this is a big problem for us. Um, so, you know, your front enders are maintaining HTML over here in the static style guide, but your Drupal people are maintaining uh, tweak templates over here. And over time, these things diverge. Uh, and as the effort required to um, maintain your application increases uh, and the demand for new features increases, the style guide quickly becomes out of sync with the Drupal, the Drupal application or whatever the backend application happens to be. Um, it comes out of sync with it, and it stops being useful as a tool anymore. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, one of the critical reasons for having a style guide at all is not as a just as a uh, it's not a nice a nicety, a nice styling, just to show off the design features of the site. It's a critical part in 
um, collaboration. Um, and it's also a critical part in what happens when new people come onto the project, trying to get that overview of exactly what exists on the site, what things are there, and, and how they're supposed to be used. So it's important that your, st your style guide is kept in sync with your Drupal theme. And but doing that is going to be a, a reasonably large administrative effort if you have to copy from one to the other. So what you really want to do is get to a point where all of these squares on the left-hand side are the same squares as on the right-hand side. Uh, so that when a change is made to the style guide, it reflects inside of Drupal. Um, and if a change were made inside of Drupal, vice, um, the same thing's going to happen. The style guide would update um, automatically. So your front-enders can still live in the style guide. They can still live outside of the application layer. But your Drupal developers can also be involved in the, in the, in the maintenance and the evolution of the, uh, the front-end components as well. Um, so yeah, so and these are called living style, maintainable style guides. I think is the um, correct term. So with that in mind, we're just going to have a look at some tools and approach. So this is the approach we we've come up with, um, and I'll just go th through this. So this is this is looking at code and um, and structure of the project. Um, so I'm looking at a Drupal theme here. This is a uh, seven theme out of uh, Drupal eight. Um, and the way it kind of looks at the, th the theme, as I was mentioning before, is that I mean it's still separating, it's still separating elements of the uh, of the front end out by effectively by file extension. So you've got a JavaScript directory there, and all your JavaScript lives inside there. There's a CSS directory, and I think if we open that up, you'd see that there was a components folder. But inside the components folder are just separate CSS files. So again, the CSS just lives on its own. Um, and then the static images, uh, and, and that templates folder is where your HTML effectively exists, your, your, your templates. So your templates, your JavaScript, your CSS, your images, they're all separate. They're all, they're all um, separate from each other. And conceptually, we want to think about things in terms of components. So we want to have everything that's to do with the same component living together, um, because it makes it easier to reason about. Um, so this is the approach we'd like to take. Um, at the top there, we've got a button. This is our sort of simplest component, one of our simple components. Um, and inside of our source directory there, we've got a components directory. And inside of that, we've got a component called button. And the button has HTML associated with it, uh, CSS. And if there's any JavaScript there, we have JavaScript in there as well. So these three things are um, connected together. They're easy to reason about. They're everything to do with a button. Um, and so looking inside. Uh, looking inside the template file there, you see that inside that twig template file, there's just a simple button, uh, uh, or a, uh, a markup. Um, and then we can take this one step further with the idea of a molecule. So this is the, um, uh, the component that's composited of other components. Um, and again, this is just a, uh, this thing will have a name. So um, I think this one's called a, an item info feature. Um, that was a name decided on by the, by the project team, um, and it's carried through. So we, we see the name inside of the wiki, we see the name inside of the front end code, and we'll see the, the name inside of, uh, inside of Drupal as a, as a thing that exists. Um, and that, that continues on, so yeah, an organism if this happens to be one, and you know, the way these are the cut up, they're just for the uh, purpose of the demonstration, like the way that you would actually cut them up would, would depend on your project and your team and your approach. Um, the idea, again, is the same. We've got a, um, a, an element composed of sub-elements inside it, and this thing can exist on its own as a, as a HTML entity, um, and it can also exist inside of Drupal. So the final thing is, how do you bring these templates inside of Drupal? Um, so the, the front-end process we've put together, um, which uh, has that, that file structure you saw earlier, um, each, of the, each of the components has SCSS, it has HTML templates inside it, Twig templates, and it has um, uh, uh, JavaScript as well. Um, we have a, uh, a, build, a build tool which goes away and loops over all those components and creates a single CSS file, a single application JavaScript file, and a folder that's full of Twig templates. Um, so it pulls them all together, separates them out in the way that Drupal wants to see them, um, and then we just um, symlink that into, uh, into the Drupal theme. Um, so this Drupal theme is called NAM, and then inside this, um, 
uh, our theme file, we've got a hook theme implementation, and effectively that hook theme function we're running there is, uh, is built for us by our build process, but all it's doing is providing a, um, a theme definition for each of those templates, each of those components. Um, and so underneath we've then got an example of how we would then, you know, this is just a simple example of how we might use one of those components inside our Drupal theme. Um, and it's just the same way as we'd use any um, uh, theme, uh, theme function, uh, theme template file. Um, Yes, yeah, so I just had a question, which was, um, is the text being set directly in the, uh, in the template file? Um, this is just a, a really simple example. Um, you, and this is a preprocess function, so you do whatever you want here at this point. But this is a, what we're creating here with the hook theme is just a theme. Uh, there, there are a series of theme functions as you'd create anywhere. Um, so how you use them, how the Drupal developer uses them is completely up to them. This is a really trivial example just to demonstrate how it's... Uh, an example of how it might be used, um, but you, you know, the, the parameters you pass in here are for you to change and define. Yes, so that could be to a string in Drupal than yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you, you're in Drupal now, so you, you can you can use all Drupal's functions and functionality. Um, but yeah, so we've we've just all we've done is we've created a whole bunch of components in HTML, CSS. The front end doesn't know anything about Drupal; they've just defined things how they how they want to, and we've brought in those templates in a way that Drupal understands it. Um, okay, so just a, a note on the tooling process, so um, uh, we're, we're going to make some of these um, things exa um, uh, available so you can, um, you, you can have a go with them, um, with some instructions. If you follow us at Decent Labs, uh, we'll be tweeting about it in the next month. Um, the, uh, the, the tool chain underneath is using Webpack. Um, if your front-enders in the room might be familiar with uh, Gold or Grunt, so Webpack's a, a similar tool to that, but it, it takes a slightly different approach. Um, and if you haven't looked at it before, um, I strongly suggest you do, because it's, um, it, it's quite an interesting way of, um, of, of bundling your modules, uh, module dependencies. So it allows us to do what we've been trying to do, which is to see all of our, our assets inside of our um, uh, static HTML uh, style sheets and, uh, and, and build them into uh, single asset, static assets for Drupal. Um, so, in conclusion, um, the recommendations here, and again, I just sort of stress this is this is the way that Decent is doing it, and it's working well for us. If you recognise any of these problems, then um, uh, we'll get some questions in a moment, and you can uh, agree or disagree with uh, the approach taken. Uh, but the, that decoupling of the user interface elements from the application development allows your front-enders the freedom to rapidly iterate over the design and to start building things out um, um, much much more quickly and um, also allows them to build things like the static style guides uh, or the maintainable style guides which really help with the understanding and the conceptual understanding of the system as a whole and the front-end system as a whole. Um, so using component design process as described to focus on reducing complexity and increasing reusability. Um, once you see the enormity of what it is you're producing, you, or, uh, you can start to see places where uh, things could be reduced. Um, have we produced too many patterns? Are there too many uh, components being produced? You start to see this, and the size of the style sheet really goes, uh, goes a long way into demonstrating that. And they also provide you with that common place where the whole development team, the, the whole team can actually get together and look at the system and understand it um, as one. Um, and finally, then, it, it helps us move away from that waterfall design process that I uh, showed earlier. So thank you for listening. Um, I seem to have rattled through that quite quickly. But <laughs> um, yeah, and if there's any questions. Try and keep, so the question was, um, in the case of uh, not custom functions, how do we uh, how, how do we deal with no templates and uh, and other templates that Drupal's spitting out by default and that you would normally override? Um, this process doesn't get in the way of that. Um, the intention is that you work with it together. So um, you may still have a node template. You may still have a node article template. Um, but at the last possible minute, you want to pull in your patterns into, inside it. So Twig allows you, um, I, think with, I think you need an extra module for it, but Twig will allow you to embed 
Uh, sorry? Uh, yes, yeah, so the component balance module allows you to embed Twig templates inside a Twig template. So at that last moment, you can pull in the, uh, those, those templates and, and composite your, um, your node template exactly as you want it. So, yeah. Any other questions? I mean, you're effectively, so the question was, what, how do you composite, well, I think it's your question, is how do you composite those things with inside your Drupal template? So if you've got a, a large pattern and a smaller pattern and a smaller pattern, how do you add the larger pattern inside it? Um, so uh, this, again, this doesn't get in the way of anything you would normally do with Drupal. So um, you've got theme, theme templates you would use at the right level. So you just pass them through. Um, I mean, what you're effectively creating is a render array uh, with something large at the top and smaller underneath. So these are the sort of things you pass through. And it's, it's a very programmatic approach to how you do it. So if you're used to building things purely in the use, um, if you're used to building Drupal sites, pulling the UI, this approach isn't going to be immediately obvious how you would go about using it. Um, but this is, you know, in order to get that data into your node template, you would use a node preprocess function, and you'd you would get your data into the right format before it fell into the um, before it fell into the node template. Um, which I don't know whether that answers your question, actually, <laughs> but. Yeah. Uh, no, it's the, the, the style guide comes first. So the question is, do, do we uh, generate a, uh, a style guide from the Drupal template? Um, so yeah, the, the answer is no, because what we do is, is, the, is in the front end that the style guide is created. Um, we, we, do, we manually craft them. The style guides are, uh, you know, there's, there's tools out there that will produce you a style guide from CSS. Um, but we prefer to take the approach of crafting that style guide because it's quite, um, because it's so important. I think it needs to be that, but it's no more than just saying, well, when I mean, you've got that list of components, it's, it's just another page that says, uh, and just lists the components one after the other and just embeds them in with some dummy content. So you have... It's using the, yeah, it's using those same Twig templates, but it's done in the front end rather than in Drupal, so yeah, yeah. No, no, it's the same template. Um, it's just there's a there's a page that kind of pulls it all together, um, but it's it's ultimately just pulling in those templates. Any questions? Um, one issue, or one concern I've had with the Drupal template is that it's Okay, so I think the question is, like, Drupal does, Drupal does stuff for you, and if you do this, then you're not going to get the benefits of some of the stuff that Drupal gives you out of the box. Well, that's a work release, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that does happen. I think that's, that's something to bear in mind. So um, if you're reliant on your accessibility to be a uh, standard that the Drupal, the Drupal flies out of the box, then yeah, you're going to lose that because you're going, actually, Drupal, I know better, and I'm going to do everything myself. Um, so you do have to, you have to think about the project and the, the size of the work that you're, you're taking on and the people that are on your project team and everything else. Uh, if you want this level of control, you're going to be giving up something else, which might be the automation of, uh, of some of those those things like accessibility. So if you've got people that know what they're doing with it, then yeah, it's fine because because we want to have that control, but we lose some of the uh, the flexibility that you're close. Uh, the, 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 the same thing happens that like our style guide has to be accessible. Like, and that's just something we have to build outside of Drupal. Like it's because we want this thing to exist. Um, so yeah.
it's quite good to have front enders that know nothing about grouping and get more people. But if you take the example of your printing, say if you were a node and you just say use content.fields, you kind of skip out not only just accessibility things, but the whole reader array caching yeah. as well. Like your front enders don't know anything about caching. And that's kind of a risk as well, I like, would say. Yeah, so I think there's a, the comment there is just around, well, do you, are you going to lose caching? Are you going to lose other things that Drupal give you? Um, it's possible. I, I think it's just an approach you need to you need to consider when, you, when you're doing this. I mean, these are only theme functions. They're not trying to replace views. Um, so, you, you know, at the right point, you just call the theme function and do, do the things as how you want them. Um, but, yeah, I, it's an approach that needs consideration always. Um, if you're not using views, then it's not such a problem. Um, but if, yeah, if, if this is an integral part of the process, then yeah, it does need to do it. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the, the, um, uh, the, the comment there was around um, uh, the paragraph module allows you to have a kind of hybrid approach where you can uh, think about components you know, within the page, but actually you just leave the rest of the page to how Drupal comes out. I think I was right. Um, yeah, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a good approach. I, in, interestingly, I mean, that, is, that, that was a step along the path that we took. And so we were, we, and then we, we went to a completely component approach, yeah. So paragraphs certainly featured at one point. Um, I mean, I think I mean, paragraphs is, a, is an interesting module. I mean, Drupal developers like paragraphs because um, it, uh, it is a very Drupal tool. Uh, it's entities and fields, and everyone can see what it, what it is and what it's doing. Um, uh, I mean, uh, we've built plenty of sites with paragraphs. Um, I think just one thing to, to think about is like just the, the enormity of what gets created and whether or not it's necessary for the, uh, the approach you want to take. Um, I think there's a whole other talk in like the, the way that we deal with content modeling inside of Drupal and whether paragraphs, where paragraphs fits inside of that. But uh, I think I take the point that, it, yes, it's, a, it's an interesting way of considering componentizing your page, that you can see these things because that's a reusable component that you can then use on every content type and you know, the ones that you actually want to do. Do you other questions? Yep. That's interesting. So are those libraries built at external to Drupal, or are they? Yeah, so the, the, the comment there was around um, uh, panels and C tools and uh, the ability to use those uh, building plugins for, for, for that architecture um, as a way of considering them as, as patterns. Um, so you can still build your pages uh, with, with Drupal and Drupal tools, and what gets inserted into the page using panels and C tools are um, elements of a, of a component library. So you can still use this approach, um, but very much within the Drupal ecosystem. Um, so if you're yeah if you're very focused on Drupal sites, there's like there's there's things within Drupal that give you these processes, so panels, uh, paragraphs. Um, I think for for us, we're thinking of a process that um, because we maintain a lot of sites and a lot of technologies. Actually, this is just one integration point. So we also have integration points into WordPress and to um, uh, Laravel as well. Um, and so with, with, we are thinking quite outside of any Drupal technologies. But, uh, Uh, 
uh, yes, so um, the question there is, uh, have you looked at any off-the-shelf tools to uh, uh, allow you to work um, using this methodology? Um, so Billy Batten Lab, which is um, from the same people that are thinking about atomic design, um, is, a, is an excellent tool. Um, uh, we've, we have used Battle Lab in the past. Um, it's, quite, it's, it's quite large. I mean, it doesn't always get in your way, but it is quite a, um, uh, a large tool. But it does give you that, that star guide out of the back. Um, one of the thoughts we had with it was that it doesn't then integrate into Drupal, um, although I believe Phase 2 have since produced an integration between Pattern Lab and Drupal. Um, uh, which uh, I haven't looked into in a huge amount of detail at this point, but I think it's fairly new. But there is that ability then to use Pattern Lab as the tool, as your front-end process tool, um, and uh, and use whatever Phase 2 is produced to do that final integration. Um, so we are looking at um, open sourcing some of this stuff, we're going to be putting onto GitHub, but it's probably also worth looking at what Phase 2 has been up to as well, because it's very similar. Um, Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, I, th I think that's what they've done, is that integration point um, from phase two. I believe so, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks very much for uh, your time. Uh, and I'll, I'll hang around for another 15 minutes or so if uh, anyone wants to ask me any other questions. Thank you very much.